baby on the deals, Nick. Okay. Let's get started. So, all right, with that, uh, we're, today we're talking about joins, and for administrative things, uh, as I said, project two, checkpoint one is due today. I did a quick show of hands to see who's actually finished, but some more people have come in the room. Who's actually done this and got 100%? There we go. All right, more people. Okay. Who has not started? <laughs> Good. Nobody. All right. Um, the other thing, too, is that there's no class this Wednesday. Uh, I had to deal with, with my parole officer, so I, I can't come to class, so that's going to be entirely canceled. Use the time, obviously, to work on your assignment, but of course, no one's going to do that, but that's okay. Um, and then the midterm exam will be in class in this room Wednesday next week on October 17th, and it will cover everything up to and including what we're talking about today. So on Monday's lecture next week, I think it's query optimization, we won't discuss, that, that won't be covered in the exam at all. Um, and there's a homework going out today on join algorithms that will be, again, germane to what's on the exam. So I'll post a study guide with, again, just a list of the chapters and, and homework problems that you should be looking at. Uh, I can also provide, uh, in the, in the, for the textbook, I think the odd problems, um, the answers or solutions are on the internet. So if you want to sort of do a further, uh, you know, further problems and prepare for the exam, you could do that. Uh, and then you can show up with a one page, or sorry, a one sheet, double sided, handwritten uh, notes with whatever you want on it. Right? Again, handwritten doesn't mean you don't, you don't take the slides and try to condense them down as small as possible. It has to be your own writing because I think you'll, you'll get more out of it that way. Okay? And then also bring your ID. And if you have any, um, I think there's, uh, if you need any um, extra time or have a, a medical issue you, want, you need to deal with for the exam, you know, please email me now. We'll get that taken care of as soon as possible. Okay? All right. So the, uh, the entire lecture today is going to be on joins. Um, this is probably the, uh, I won't say difficult, but the most challenging aspect of building a database system, a relational database system, is supporting joins and doing this efficiently. Um, you know, the, the, the NoSQL guys, when they came out, they said, oh, joins are slow. We're not going to do joins. Uh, some of them are starting to add joins. Not quite well, but that's OK. Um, but this is end up really going to be the most expensive thing, where the data system is going to be spending most of their time on in, in, in for analytical workloads. For OLTP workloads, they're usually uh, you know, doing single key lookups. Or if they're doing joins, we can use an index nested loop join, which we'll see in a second. So joins aren't that expensive in OHP workloads because you're just not joining large segments of data. In analytical workloads, this is totally the case where uh, you know, we've done our own profiling. I've seen reports and other things where an overwhelming majority, maybe over even 50% of the time that database system is, is doing work when it executes queries, will be spent in join algorithms. So it's really important for us to get, to get this right. So, to understand sort of at a high level the why we actually have to do the joins, um, we talked about this in the beginning of the class. We talked about how we would, would normalize tables to reduce the amount of redundant and un unnecessary repetition of data in our, in, in our database. And so the way to sort of think about this is like we have our, our original tuples, and there may be columns or attributes where we're, we're repeating data, and then we're going to normalize them, essentially split them up, uh, into to separate tables so that we don't repeat this information. So the join algorithm, so the join operators are essentially putting them back together to reconstruct the original tuples. Right? And we didn't talk about normal forms because I didn't want to I didn't want to uh, to sort of torture you guys with that information. Uh, but the high level concept is, is pretty pretty basic. And this is actually the, the example database we looked at the very beginning of the lecture. Right? We want to keep track of our music store. We have artists that put out albums. And we said that we're going to have this cross-reference table, art, artist album, that has a foreign key reference from the, from the artist uh, table to, and the album table. We did this because there may be some albums where, where we would have uh, multiple artists appearing on it. And instead of having you know, an entry where we're repeating the album information over and over again, we can again normalize it by breaking it up based on these foreign keys. And and then now we have one entry for the album and one entry for the artist, even though there may be uh, it's a many, many to many relationship between the two of them. So normalization is the process of designing your application, your application's database at a logical level and splitting it up 
uh, uh, in, to, set, to normalize tables, and then joins are essentially just putting back together. Right? So that, that's what we're trying to do today. So today's class, we're going to focus on the, 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 the algorithms for joining two tables. Specifically, we're going to focus on joining two tables with an equijoin, because that's going to be the, the most common approach. Uh, we're not going to talk about, there are ways to do k-way joins or multiple t uh, more than two table joins. <coughs> Excuse me. We're not going to cover that in this class. We'll cover that in, in the advanced class. This is the most common type of join. And you know, I can't say exact, exactly how many numbers or what percentage of the workloads will look like this. If you're doing join, you're most always going to be doing a uh, inner equi join. So the, the, the reoccurring theme we'll see as we talk about these different algorithms is that you're almost always going to want to put the, 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 the smallest table that you're trying to join and smallest in terms of number of tuples that are going to be fed into the join operator. You always want to put that as the outer table. And I'll explain what, what an outer table is in a second. Because this is always going to produce the, uh, the, 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 best, the best execution time, the, the lowest cost of doing the join as possible. So before we get into the actual algorithms, I'm going to spend time talking about two additional things. We've got to talk about what these join operators are actually going to produce as output. And then we can talk about how we're going to determine whether one algorithm is better than another. What, what are we going to use for our criteria to determine what's the cost of executing a query? Or sorry, executing a join. So say that we have this sample query like this. We're doing an inner echo join on RNS on the RID equals SID. And we're going to have a join operator in our query plan that's going to produce some output and shove it up to the projection operator above it. And we talked a little bit about this when we talked about query processing, about what the output of these operators look like. Uh, but in the case of joins, it's, this is you can actually have the most variance um, because there's a bunch of different ways you can do these things. And it really depends on things like what query processing model you're using, whether it's vectorized, uh, materialization, or the iterator model. Depends on also the storage model, if you're a column store versus a row store. Then it also depends on what the query actually looks like, meaning what data are we going to need above the join operator in our query plan, and that will determine what we need to produce as, as our output. So we talked about this before, right? We talked about uh, the, the concept of latent materialization in, in for query processing models. Um, we said that the, the, the sort of most easiest way to do, to, to produce output is just copy all the data that, that you're fed, in, fed into your operator and shove it as, as your output. All right, so say that in this example here, we're joining uh, you know, R and S together. And then we have one tuple in R and two tuples in S. So our join operator would essentially just concatenate all the attributes of R and all the attributes of S for every tuple that, that's produced in our output. And then we shove that up through in, in the query plan. Right? And in this case here, we have a, uh, above that, we have the projection. And the projection would know that we only need to filter out uh, the, you know, the, the, the data that we actually don't need. So in this case here, we only need RID and, and C date. So the projection operator will just pull out uh, those two attributes. So the advantage of this approach is that you never have to go back to the base table and get more data. Because everything you need at this point is that to produce the rest of the query plan is baked in this output here. Uh, but there may be some cases where you, you know, if the table are really, tables are is really wide, meaning there's a lot of columns for both the, inter, the, the two tables you're trying to join together, it may make sense to actually only produce a subset of the output. Right? In this case here, say if S had a bunch more attributes and we only know we need value ID uh, going up, then maybe we don't want to copy all the other crap into, into the join operator and have the join operator copy it back out. We talked about this approach as well in the context of a column store system where we can only pass around maybe the record IDs or offsets of the tuples from one operator to the next. And we do this because we don't want to have to copy large, you know, large tuples uh, going forward. So in this case here, our join operator would only produce the, the, the keys that we joined on and the record IDs of the matching tuples. And then we shove that up into the query plan. And then when we get into our uh, projection operator, it knows that, oh, I need C date from the S table. So let me go to the S table and pick out that information. If this is a column store, then this is super easy to do because the, the, the C date column, the creation date column will be in, a, in, in its own separate pages. And we just jump to the right offset for, for what we need. Um, for other, if it's a row store, this would be kind of, you probably would not want to do this because then you have to go back and copy the entire tuple, which would be wasteful. 
So I don't remember what, what this technique was called before. We talked about it uh, when we talked about query processing. Late materialization, right? We're materializing the tuple that we need to produce for the output as late as possible in, in our query plan. Um, a lot of the column storage systems uh, did this. Uh, Vertica was really big on this as well, but I, as talking with them over the summer, it turns out they stopped doing this because it actually turned out to be too slow. Um, I don't remember the full details, but this is one technique that people can use. It's one of the advantages you get from a column store over a row store for doing analytics. Again, the way to, the way to think about this is we know what the query plan is ahead of time because it's SQL. We, we know exactly what we're executing. We know what attributes we're going to need. And at the lowest level in, in our joint operator, we can make decisions about what we actually need to maintain or produce from one operator to the next. And it'll matter when we do our joins because when we do a hash join, we're going to populate a hash table. And that we don't want our hash table to get too big because we're going to run out of memory. So we want to be, uh, we want to just have the minimal amount of information we need inside our hash table to compute the join um, and, not, and not waste space. Okay? So now when we start talking about these different join algorithms, the method we're going to use to determine whether one algorithm is better than another or determine what the cost is, is going to be strictly based on disk I.O. Right? As we said in, in this class, going to disk is always the most expensive thing. So when we, you know, we always want to determine, you know, make choices about our algorithms based on how much, how much we're going to read and write from disk. Once everything's in memory, then, then you know, the, the cost changes, what the cost metric we should use changes, like cache misses and other things like that. But for our purposes here, the disk is always the slowest thing. So that's what we're going to be, we're going to be worried about. So we're going to use this join uh, query here as a running example throughout the lecture. And what we're going to say is that uh, we're going to define our cost functions, our cost uh, formulas for these join algorithms in terms of the number of pages and tuples in, the, in these two tables. So we're going to say there's m pages in table R. And in total, table R has m, lowercase m tuples. And there'll be n pages in S and lowercase n tuples in, in, that, in that table as well. So for this class, although I just talked about the output of these join operators, we're going to ignore the cost of outputting the, 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 jo of the, of the join op operation um, in our calculations because that depends on what the data looks like and what your query is. Right? We could have a billion tuples fed as the input into our join operator, but then it only produces one, one, one tuple as its output. Right? And we don't know because we don't know what the actual data is. We're trying to do this at the, our asymptotic analysis at a high level. And this is also the output, the cost of producing the output is going to be the same from one algorithm to the next. Like if I use a nested loop join and it produces a billion tuples as output, the same join algorithm, uh, sorry, this, the same join but using a hash join algorithm will produce the same number of tuples. So therefore the output cost will be the same there. So we're gonna, we can ignore that cost because it's going to be the same no matter what algorithm, algorithm we use. So we also again don't know, we just, as I said, we don't know how much tuple, how many tuples we're going to produce to this output, but we'll know this, we'll figure out, we'll learn how to compute this on Monday next week when we talk about query optimization. We'll look, talk about how to look, derive statistics from our tables and use that to estimate the number of tuples that we're going to use as input and output for our, our different operators in the query plan. So the last thing to mention also too is that, as I said in the beginning, we're focused in this class on the cost analysis of equijoins or inner joins between two tables. Because again, this is going to be the most, the most widely used join algorithm we're going to have in our system. Most queries are going to actually execute like this. Um, and we don't really care about things like cross product because there's not really any way to make those things go faster. Right? Cross product is just two for loops to combine all possible you know, tuples, to create all possible pairs of tuples in, in our two tables. So there's, there's nothing really we can do to make that go, go faster. Where in, in our inner joins or equi joins, we can be a bit more careful how we stage our, our data and, and do better than the sort of the, the, the naive approach. So we're also not going to talk about left outer joins or, or sorry, outer joins in general. We're going to focus on inner joins. I'll talk a little about this when, when we talk about sort merge because you'll see how you can easily do uh, uh, left outer joins or uh, sort of outer joins. The, the basic algorithms are the same. You just maybe do some extra step like backtracking or check a little bit more data than, than you would otherwise if you're doing an inner join. For all our algorithms, again, we're, we're going to focus on inner joins with, with equijoin uh, predicates. All right, so at a high level, there's three classes of join algorithms. 
There's nested loop join, sort merge join, and hash join. So we're going to spend most of our time uh, at the end talking about hash join, but it's good to understand these other joins because there may be different scenarios where you may want to use one versus another. You know, for example, the index nested loop join is which, which you're almost always going to want to use for all TP workloads because you're going to have an index available for you. All right. I'll say in general that the main spoiler is that hash join is always going to be fastest, and we'll see how to make it uh, perform well as we go along. All right, so the most basic join algorithm is called the, the simple nested loop join. And I'm putting the little slow marker here just to say that, again, this is like the dumbest thing you can do, but it will produce the right output. So it's exactly as it sounds. The nested loop join is comprised of two nested for loops. So on, on the, the, the first for loop iterates over one table, and for every tuple in that table, we're going to iterate over the second table. And we check to see whether the tuples match our join predicate. And if so, then we emit them as our output. And so the, in the parlance we're going to use in describing all our join algorithms are, are the ideas of outer, outers versus inner table. So it's exactly as it looks. So the outer for loop will be iterating over the outer table. And then the inner for loop iterates over the inner table. So I'll use, the inner, ta I'll use inner and outer table multiple times throughout the lecture. And this is just, just what it means. So why is this algorithm bad? Right, sort of obvious, right? For every single tuple we're going to have in our outer table, R, we're going to scan the entire inner table from beginning to end all over again. So if you now compute the cost of this in terms of pages, it's going to be M, big M plus little m times n. Right? So we have to scan the outer table once. We have, it has m pages, so that's what that cost is. And then for every single tuple in the outer table, of which there's little case m of m, we're going to scan every single page in, in the outer table. Right? So when you actually now put numbers into this, so say we have our database has 1,000 pages in the outer table with 100,000 tuples, and 500 pages in the inner table with 40,000 tuples. When you run this formula with these numbers, uh, you can see that for just doing the simple nested loop join on these two tables produces 50 million IOs. And if, assuming you have like an, even an, a fast SSD where it's one tenth of a millisecond per IO, then compute this join, it takes 1.3 hours. Right? That, that's, that's pretty bad, right? It's pretty slow. Um, so, what's one thing we could do to make this go faster? Just, just this algorithm. What's a, not, what's a simple thing we can do? What's that? I thought somebody said swap. Excellent. Yes. Perfect. Yes. So, as I said in the beginning, you always want to try to make the smaller table be the outer table. So, if we do that, right? Table S is smaller than the table R. So, we use S as the outer table. Now your your IOs get down to 40 million, and your, but your total time is still 1.1 hours. Yes. Why? So, so say it again, sorry? Uh, yeah, sorry. Move that over by one. Thank you. Yeah, screw it. Let's just fix it now. Actually, no, I don't want to break this. But yes, just move it over by one. Sorry. It doesn't change it, though. It's still going to be hour, right? So. Right, so even if we swap the, the inner table with the outer table, we're still doing pretty crappy here, right? Because again, we're doing the dumbest thing. We're ignoring the fact that we actually can pack multiple tuples in a single page. We know this because you guys built your own, your own buffer pool manager. So you can have multiple tuples per page. So in this case, this algorithm, you're assuming that for every single tuple, it's going to be a page fetch to go get that, that tuple, right? And so what you really want is sort of a buffer or a page nested loop join. Uh, the, the textbook call is going to block nested loop join, but the basic same, same idea. Where now we're just going to iterate over every single block in the outer table and every single block in the inner table. And then within the, the tuples within those two blocks or two pages, we'll then do our comparison. Right? So now in this case scenario, now we have four nested loops put together, but it's still, you know, sort of, you know, there's 
at a high level, we're just iterating over the outer table and just iterating over the inner table, but we're doing this on a, on a per block basis. So now if we go back to our, our formula, instead of having little m on, on the, 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 the inner part for the inner table, now we have big M. Right? So this is, a, this is a little bit better, but still not great. And of course, as I said, the smaller one is always what we're going to want to put as the outer table. So in this case here, it's the one with the smaller number of pages, not the, the smallest number of tuples. All right? So again, do our formula. Uh, now I got the, the, the thousand correct. Okay. So now if we do this, uh, M, big M plus big M times big N, now we're doing uh, 500,000 IOs, and we can compute our join in 50 seconds on a fast SSD. Right? This is better, but we can still do better than this, right? This is in this case here. We're assuming that we only have three blocks or three buffer pages we can use, right? We have one for the outer table, one for the inner table, and then one for our output, right? You always need one for the output. So if we have multiple pages, multiple buffers available, then we can use B minus two pages to do the scan of the outer table. And we'd have one page for the inner table and then one page for our output. All right? And now, again, the algorithm basically looks the same, which is now we have B minus two pages for doing our, for the topmost for loop. Again, now we're taking advantage of the fact that we have a buffer manager that can provide us with some extra space where we actually can start paging in uh, tuples or pages from our, from our uh, table and try to read as much as we can while it's in memory. So now we use this. Uh, the fact that we have b minus two pages for the outer table in our formula, we end up with this this cost. We say big M plus the ceiling of M divided by b minus two times n. Right. If the entire uh, two tables, sorry, if, if the outer table fits entirely in main memory, right, where b is greater than m plus two, because again we always need two pages for the inner and outer. Now we can get this down to 1,500 IOs, right? You still have to scan, um, you know, you have to scan the entire outer table, put everything in memory, but now we for now you just then just scan the inner table, right? So it's M plus N. So now you can now we're cutting this down uh, quite a lot, but of course we saw this before when we talked about sequential flooding. This assumes that no other query is running that you don't care about throwing away anything else in your in your in your buffer pool. This assumes that you, you can dedicate all the database's memory to execute just your one query, which may or may not be the right thing depending on, on your workload. So again, in these both, both in all these examples, the block nest loop join or the simple nest loop join, at the end of the day, they're just sequential scans. Right? You're just scanning through every single tuple or every single block and just doing your comparison that way. There may be a scenario though, if we have a index available to us, right? Sequential scan sucks, right? We know it sucks, and it's, as we said, it's pressure on the buffer pool man, uh, memory manager that that may be taking memory away from other parts of the system. So if we have an index available to us, which is often the case if you have foreign keys, then we can use that index to, to find matches in our inner table, right? Instead of actually doing the sequential scan on the inner table, we just probe the index to find the the, the one or, the, or the, the small number of tuples that we want, and then we just do our join for that. So best case scenario, we have an index available to us. Uh, if not, we can try and maybe build one on the fly, which is essentially what a hash join is doing. Um, I don't know if any system actually will build a B plus G on the table on the fly. Everyone just builds the hash table. But again, at the high level, it's the same idea. So now our, our for loops look like this. So for every single tuple in the, in the outer table, we're going to again scan, do a probe in our index, assuming we have an index on a, some attributes, some sub, subset of the attributes for our join key. And then if we have a match from an index, then we omit them as our output. So what I'm showing here, the reason why you do the index probe, then still check to see whether they match. Again, because the index may only have, uh, say, the, the, say our join key, our join is on three attributes, the index may only have the first two. So we'll go find the, our matches, then we go fetch the tuple, then we go check to see whether the other key matches our, our join. So for this, the, 
the cost of the index probe we're going to say is some constant c. Right? Because this depends on what the data structure is, depends on what the, the index looks like, depends on whether the, the thing is in memory or not. Right? We just say it's some, some fixed cost. That'll be the same for ev every single tuple. Um, we know in the case of a B plus tree, it's log n. Uh, we know in the case of a hash table, in best case scenario, it's O1. Right? So again, we just say we just say it's C. So now our cost is going to be M, big M for scanning every single tuple in the outer table, which is unavoidable. And then for every single tuple in the outer table, we do we do one probe. So it's it's the cost of scanning every single page in the outer table, and then for every single tuple in the outer table, we're doing at least we're doing exactly one probe into into our index to find our matches. So that's why the formula comes out like this. All right? So again, nested loop joints, super simple to understand. You're always going to try to pick the smaller table as the outer as the outer table, and then you just do you know do a sequential scan over the outer table, and either do a sequential scan or index probe on on the inner table. And you want to try to put as much as the outer table in memory as possible um, to be able to reuse that that data as you're as you're doing your scan on the on the inner table. And if you have an index on the inner table, then 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 that's great, and you should definitely use that. And database system optimizer will try to try to always pick the index. All right. So, any questions about about nested loop join? Again, it's the first loop. This is the first join algorithm everyone pretty much implements when they when they build a database system for the first time because it's the easiest one to implement. Okay. The next class of, uh, join algorithms is called the sort merge join. So, I think your textbook calls this merge join. Uh, I, other textbooks call it sort merge join. They, they, they mean the same thing. And what's sort of confusing about this is like, in the sort merge join, you can use the external merge sort algorithm to sort your tables that we talked about last time. All right? So, it, but it, again, they're all the same. So there's two phases. So in the first phase, we're going to sort both the, the, the inner and the outer table based on the join keys. And then when that's done, then we're going to have these, we're going to establish these cursors at the beginning of the two tables at the top. And then they're going to walk down sort of in, in, in a, a proper order and doing comparisons of wherever the cursor is pointing at and if, to see whether we have a match. And, be, and the idea, high level idea about this is that because we're sorting things uh, ahead of time, when now we start scanning the table with our cursor, we know that as the cursor moves down, because it's in sort of order, we never have to go back and look at previous values we, we've examined before. Because we know, we know everything at that point is, is wherever cursor is pointing at, everything below it, or sorry, everything back above it is less or greater than, based on how you sorted it, than what we're looking at now. So we never have to go look at things we, we've looked at before. I'll show an example of what I mean by in a second. And again, for the sort phase, you can use quick sort, you can use heap sort, or you can use the external merge sort algorithm we talked about last class. So roughly, the algorithm for the, the, merge sort, the sort merge join looks like this. So in the first phase, you just sort the two tables based on the join keys. We know how to do that from last class. And then you have these cursors on the sorted tables that they're just going to scan through the, the two tables until either one of them reaches the end. And at the at each each step, or each sort of iteration through the while loop here, if the outer table's cursor is greater than the inner table's cursor, then you increment the inner table's cursor. If the outer table's cursor is less than the inner table's cursor, then you increment the outer table's cursor. Otherwise, you check to see whether you, you have a match, and if so, then you produce that as your output uh, from the join table, from the join tuple, and then you increment the 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 inner table's cursor by one. So again, the algorithm might, might be difficult to follow, but let's look at this visually. Again, so this, these are the two tables we want to sort for this for this join query here. So in the first phase, we do our sorting, or we do our sort on the on the join key. Again, so this is just running external merge sort, a quick sort, whatever you want, and then we produce our, our new our new tuples like this. And then we have two cursors start the, at the top of each of the two tables. And they're going to, again, go down in, in, in step one by one and do comparisons across the, each other to see whether we have a match. So in the very first step, we're going to check to see whether in the outer table's cursor, 
the value is pointing at, the cursor is pointing at the value of 100. The inner table's cursor is pointing at value 100. These two are equal, therefore we, we know we have a match, and we produce a tuple as our output. Because we have a match, then we now increment the inner table's cursor by one and do another comparison again. We don't move the outer table cursor here. So again, now 100 equals 100. So we know we have a match. We produce our tuple in, uh, in the output table, and then we increment the inner table's cursor. So now at this point, we're comparing 1, 100, and 200. But since 200 is greater than 100, we know we need to now move the outer table's cursor by 1. And this is sort of what I was saying that we never have to backtrack. So at this point here, we don't have a match. 100 is not equal to 200. So we know that for the inner table's cursor, we've already looked at everything that comes before it. So now when we increment here now to 200, we never need to go back and look at anything that we've seen before because it's, everything's going to be less than whatever our cursor is pointing at now. So everything's going to be less than 200. So we know there's nothing that we ever need to compare again. So we really only have to essentially examine, the cursor only looks at each tuple once. It may do multiple comparisons with the tuple that it's looking at, but it never goes back and looks at the other ones. So now we have 200 equals 200. We produce our output. We increment the uh, inner table's cursor. Now we have 200 not, does not, is not equal to 400, and 200 is less than 400. So we increment the outer table's cursor by 1. 300 is less than 400, so we increment it again. And then now 400 equals 400. So we, we produce a 200 output, increment the inner table. And now 400 does equal 500, increment the outer table. 500 equals 500, and we produce our output. So what happens next? What happens here? What's that? that? Well, he says the fact. That, let's say, assuming this is this is this is the entire table, right? That he's right. That this is it. We're done, right? Because we reached the end of the inner table. So it doesn't matter that there's some some more tuples here, right? This thing will increment to nothing. So we know that there's there's nothing else we could possibly look at because again we don't backtrack. So it doesn't matter that uh, we have a match here. It doesn't matter that, that these guys still exist. We don't care. Yes? But those two at the bottom can still match with the inner table cancel. So he says those two can, can still match with the. It can still be 500. Yes, 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 right, yes. Um, forgot about that. Yeah, he's right. Okay. So, yeah, this is technically wrong. So, if this was 500, then this thing would, would go down. Uh, and you have to increment this one down, not this one. Yeah, so it's, it's slightly off. You have to deal with that case. Yes? His, his statement was ID is a primary key. It's not, be, well, in this case here, it, yeah, it is, this is the primary key, or it's a unique key at least. So, Yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, I'm gonna get into cardinality. So this is n to one. So there could be but there's multiple tuples here for one tuple here. So you, if you know that, then you know that if you reach the end of this, you'll never have any other match because you've already matched everything, right? If it's n to n, then you would have to go to, to the very bottom of this one here. Yeah, that's, that's a corner case I forgot to discuss. Thank you, I'll fix that. Yes? If the second 200 was as well as 100. So you're back here. Yeah, so, so yeah, his question is, say if this was actually 100, not 200. Um, right, if, you, if it's end to end, then, yeah, in this case, you would have to backtrack. So you'd have to know that, all right, uh, you'd have to know that, like, all right, in the value I'm looking at, if this is 100, where did I stop at? Same thing, like, where's the, what's the, how far do I have to go back to, to reset to the current value? So you would have to say, all right, there's 100, 100. So I know that if I have to reset, I have to start back up here. Same thing on here. If I have to reset, I come back up here. So for the basic way to work is on the outer table for every single tuple. Sorry, you never backtrack on the outer table. You always backtrack on the inner table. So if I start at the outer table, 100, 100, I match that. Next guy's 100, 100, that matches. And then I go down to 200, and I come down increment this by one, and now I'm at 100 again, I have to know I have to go back 
on the inner table to start at 100 again and, and scan down again. So there's some extra metadata you have to maintain if, you if you're doing end-to-end -end joins. But at a high level, the cost is, is, is you know, worst case scenario, if they're exactly all the same, then it's just two sequential scans over and over again. But we'll, we'll keep it simple. I was everyone clear what, what I was saying there, right? In this example here, we never have to backtrack because we know it's a one to end join. So for every one tuple on this table, there can be multiple tuples on, on, on this table, but not vice versa. So as we scan down, we never have to backtrack. If it's end to end, then you have to backtrack on the on the inner table to you know as you go down on the outer table. But you, instead of having to do a complete sequential scan every single time, you can just can only backtrack to the point where you just need, you know the values that you need to do, do your comparison and start. Okay. And then it gets in weird, you know, the cost analysis can get weird because now if, if you're if you're backtracking across page boundaries, then you're fetching in pages again and again. We're, we're keeping it simple, ignoring that. All right, so the cost for this, right, we have the sort cost of, of the outer table, the sort cost of the inner table, and that's just the formula we had from last class when we talked about external merge sort. And then we have our merge cost, we have best case scenario, it's a sequential scan on the outer table and a sequential scan on the inner table, n plus n. So the total cost of these is just the combination of these two formulas. So again, using our example database, and now say we have 100 buffer pages to do, do our joins, sorry, do our sorts for both R and S. That means we can sort them in, in just two passes. So the cost of sorting R is 3,000. The cost of sorting S is 1,350. The merge cost is just 1,500. So the total cost of the merge plus, sorry, the sort plus the merge is 5,800. And that roughly comes out to be uh, 59 seconds if you're doing this on SSD. So we're getting a little bit better, right? We were, um, I forget what we were had before with the, with, with the other joins, but it was roughly around a second. So now we're getting into sub-second numbers here. All right? So the, the worst case scenario is, is sort of the example we, we, we briefly talked about of where you have to do backtracking on, on the adder table. So now it essentially becomes the, the you, know, you play the cost of sorting, but then all your attributes are the same for the, to the two tables. So you're just doing for every single page in the outer table, you're doing complete sequential scan on the inner table. Then you backtrack on the inner table, go down to the next page and do it all over again. So in the worst case scenario for the sort merge join, uh, it'd be M times M plus plus your sort cost, all right? So again, we'll see this on Monday next week when we talk about query optimization. The database system tries to maintain internal statistics about your database, about your tables, to make decisions about, oh, my, my distribution, my values is really crappy, so therefore I don't want to even do the sort merge join because I know I'm just going to be waiting to do wasted I.O. because I'm not getting any benefit of actually sorting. I would say that this case, this particular example is super rare, right? Because think about what this actually would be. This would be two tables that you want to join where they have one value in this column and they're exactly the same for every single tuple, right? I don't want to say it never happens because people do stupid things all the time, but like, you know, in, 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 you know, in, in a real application, you, you, I don't think you would, this would be unlikely. All right, so when is the sort merge join useful? Well, obviously when the tables are already sorted on the, your join key, you know, if you're doing like an index organized table, then you don't actually have any sort cost because it's already sorted on the thing you want to join in anyway. So that, that, that's an added bonus, right? You, you cut that ent out entirely, and it's just, then it's just the cost of two sequential scans. Um, also, if, you're, if your query requires the output to be sorted on your join key, then you're killing two birds with one stone because now you do the, the join, and it'll, it'll produce output that's already sorted on the thing that, that's in your order by clause, so then you don't have to do any extra sorting for the order by. It's already sorted, right? So again, the optimizer, the data system can recognize, oh, I have an order by clause for my join, and the order by is the same thing I'm joining on, so just don't do, just do sort merge, and then don't do the order by. And you cut out an operator entirely, entirely from your query plan, right? So again, the, 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 again, the output, so the input for these operators could be either on, Again, the data system will know 
all right, I'm getting data from this from this operator below me in the tree, and I, I, I'm going to know the physical properties of that data. I'll know whether it's actually been already sorted or not. So it uses that in its, in its determination to, to, to decide whether it wants to do a sort merge join or, or another algorithm. Okay? All right, so any questions about sort merge join? Okay. So let's spend most of our time talking about hash joins. So as they said, hash join is the most important algorithm. This is where most major analytical databases are going are to be spending the, most of their time. Um, because in general, this always turns out to be the best. So the basic idea is that it's almost like the index nested loop join where we'll, have a, uh, we'll, we'll build a hash table on the fly, and then we use that to probe the, uh, in the inner table to see whether we have, have a match. So the way to think about this and why this works is that if we have, if we're doing a join on, on two tuples and their attributes match, all right, meaning, say so again, we're doing equal join to something equals something. If we then hash those attributes that we're doing our join on, the hash will have to produce the same, the hash function will produce the same hash value as well. So if two values in the unhashed form equal, are the same, then two values in their hashed form will have to be the same. So we can rely on this aspect of that to then do, do our join. So we can just do our join on the hash attributes rather than the actual raw attributes themselves. So at a high level, that's essentially what we're trying to do in, in a hash join. So we have uh, two phases. So in the, in the first phase, we're going to build our hash table on the, the outer relation, the outer table, using some hash function. It doesn't matter what it is, murmur hash. Um, murmur hash, city hash, whatever, whatever you want to use. And then the second phase is then we just do a sequential scan over the inner relation, and for every single tuple, we're going to hash the join key attributes of that tuple with our same hash function we used in the first phase, and that'll tell us, that'll, that'll point us to some location in our hash table, and we can use that to determine whether we have a match. So just like we don't care what hash function we use, we don't actually care what, what hash table we use. We can use linear hashing, cuckoo hashing, uh, Robinhood hashing, right? It doesn't matter, as long as we can make sure that we, we hash something and it jumps to a particular spot in our table and we can find the thing that we're looking for. So the basic hash join algorithm, again, visually looks like this. Again, the, 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 the algorithm is that you just build a hash table, HTR, on the outer table, and then for every single table, every single tuple in the inner table, you're just going to hash it and look up in the hash table to see whether you have a match. So again, we just do a sequential scan of the outer table, populate HTR, and then do a sequential scan on the inner table, and just probe inside the hash table to see whether we have a match. Right? That's it. Pretty straightforward. Same thing almost as like the, the, uh, the index nested loop join, except in the index nested loop join, we had the index on the inner table, where in this case we're building the, the, the hash table on the outer table. Right? So what do we actually put in our hash table? Well, again, the key is just going to be the attributes that we're doing our join on. Right? It has to be, it only works if you're doing uh, equi join or quality predicates, because we want to know where, whether something equals something. If we have an inequality, if we have a, uh, a less than or greater than, then the hash join doesn't work because we can't actually do that comparison with our, in, in the hash table. Right? It always has to be an, an exact match. And then what we actually put in the value portion of the payload of a hash table again depends on the implementation and depends on what the, what the output of the operator should be. So you can put the entire tuple if you want. Um, and we said that we wanted to do this because we'd avoid having to go back and get more data. So if we build our hash key, uh, if we have our join key be, uh, if, we, if we want to make our join key or the, the thing we're hashing on be a subset of the join keys, which we could do if we wanted to, then we still have to maintain the rest of the join key inside of, our, inside of the, the payload, because then we have to do a, 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 an evaluation inside of that anyway. We have to do that anyway, actually, if we hash the entire join key or not, because we could have collisions, and we have to go and then make sure that we actually have an exact match inside, inside of the hash table. This obviously takes up more space, um, and it, it may cause our hash table to overflow. And you know, have, have long chains or other things that you know requires to allocate more pages. 
Or we could use the tuple identifier or the record ID offset that we talked about at the beginning, which we want to do dictate materialization. We said this would be better for column stores because you're only reading in data that you actually need, but it, you may have to go fetch that data later on up in the query plan depending on what, what, what you actually need. So if everything fits in memory, then our hash join is super fast because we just rip through the, the, the outer table, better hash table, then rip through the inner table, and the hash table entirely will be, be there, and we just probe inside of it and find things that we want. Of course, we said that this is not always the case of, of, in, the, in the large databases, so we, this is why we have a buffer manager that allows us to be able to spill things out to disk as needed. But just like we don't want the operating system to control what we swap in and out of memory, we actually don't, don't want the buffer manager to, to make its own decisions about what to swap in and out, right? Because it may end up swapping things out we don't want to as we're doing our join. I'm going to take a guess why. Why is that the case? So what is it about the, how we're doing our, our say, in the, say we built our hash table, and now we're doing our probe. Actually, in both, both cases, on the build side and the probe side, what does the access pattern of our, ha of our hashing function look like? It, it's random, right? Because you're taking whatever value you have, hashing it to some random location in memory. And it's, we can't predict this ahead of time. So if we just let the, 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 the buffer manager decide, oh, well, I'll just use LRU or clock to decide what, what to swap out or, or evict from my, my buffer pool, it may end up putting out something that the, 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 next, hash, the next hashing or the next key would actually need. You be smart about this and try to stage things in smaller chunks that where we can try to get everything to fit in memory and we don't have, uh, and we don't have this problem of, of things thrashing because the buffer manager is removing things that we actually need. So the algorithm we're going to use to handle hash joins that are larger than the amount of memory that is available to us is called the grace hash join. Um, so it's called Grace Hash Join because there was a project in the 1980s out of the University of Tokyo uh, for a database, database machine called Grace. Um, and it, the, 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 the system doesn't exist anymore. It never got commercialized. But the, they have a paper at the time that describes how to do the hash join I'm going to show you. And then for historical purposes, everyone just calls it the Grace Hash Join. So the basic idea is a lot similar to what we saw in the external merge sort, where we're going to break up the, uh, in the problem into smaller chunks that can fit in memory, and then we can do the join on those, the chunks that fit memory and not worry about fetching other pages that will never ever match. So the basic idea is that instead of just building a hash table for one side, we're actually going to hash the other side as well and put things in partitions or buckets and then come back and build hash tables on just what's in those buckets. So again, as I said, the, this is the picture of, from the, the website, I think it's the only picture I could find online of the, the Grace database machine. Who here has actually ever heard of the term database machine before? Nobody. Who here has ever heard of the term database appliance? Nobody. Okay. So the, the way to think about this is a database appliance is like, instead of the, you know, it's, say I want to set up MySQL or Postgres. What I could do is I could go buy a machine from Supermicro or Dell or EMC, you know, set it up, load the operating system, then download the database system software, install the database system, and sort of set it up myself. Right? That's what most people do. A database appliance would be you'd buy a machine already pre-configured and tuned for your, your database, you know, for whatever database system you want to run, and it, it sort of, you know, it's sort of the it's been set up for the exact hardware that you're running it on. And so that way you don't have to worry about how, how to set up how much buffer pool to memory to use or how much to tune it for the OS and other things. All that's done for you. It's sort of like a, um, like a batteries, batteries included database system that comes on its own hardware. Right? Um, so a database machine was this, this sort of movement in the 1980s where people would sort of build like an appliance where it's sort of like a, it was a pre-configured uh, you know, one rack unit that would have the database system pre-installed. But they went a bit farther and they actually had specialized hardware on it, not FPGAs or GPUs, so sort of custom hardware that was that the data system could take advantage of. Right? And this was thought at the time, early 1980s, that this was the future of databases, that everyone's going to have these, these custom hardware thing, uh, machines 
that the data system could exploit and get much better performance than you could on commodity hardware, right? Of course, that didn't pan out, right? Because uh, with Moore's law always getting better and better, especially in the 1980s, less so now, the whatever advantage you had by the time you manufactured a database machine that had specialized hardware to do whatever you wanted to do. So, for example, a lot of these systems had specialized hardware to do hash joins. By the time you actually got that in production, you know, Intel came out with a, a better chip that uh, could, you know, outperform whatever you could you you were doing before. All right, so these things never really took off. Um, at least the customized hardware, database appliances still exist. There's a bunch of different uh, examples here of different manufacturers that sell stuff. So the first one is IBM selling you, you know, a ZOS machine to run DB2. Uh, there was a startup out of San Francisco called Clustrix that would sell you an appliance of a tuned MySQL uh, or MySQL-like database system. And of course, Oracle is probably the most famous one. They'll sell you lots of hardware that that comes with the data system already pre-configured and running on it. Like Exadata is is you know hundreds. There's, there's Exadata brings them a lot of money, basically selling these these appliances. So again, Grace was not an appliance. It was a, it was the database machine, which is an appliance plus extra stuff. Of course, you know, nobody, nobody still uses this, but everyone still uses the Grace hash join. So that's what we're going to cover. So I, I don't know what the textbook calls this. It might call this Grace hash join. It might call it like partition hash join. The basic idea is the same. I think Wikipedia might call this Grace hash join. All right, so as I said, on a regular hash join, we would just scan the outer table, build a hash table, and then have the inner table do a sequential scan and just probe inside of that. But here what we're trying to do is we're going to try to divide up the the outer, outer and inner tables into buckets that can fit into memory, uh, and then we'll build hash tables on just those, those buckets, or just build a hash table on the bucket. All right, so we do a sequential scan on the outer table. Again, we're not building a hash table. Right, actually, this should not be HT. These should, should be buckets. So we're going to, that's the same thing, right? So it's a hash table. We're doing, and we're going to build buckets. Same thing on the other side. And then these things can now get swapped out the disk. But the way to think about this is because, again, we're using the same hash function on both sides, we know that sort of at every level, there, there will be tuples that will match. So because you know, in hash function one we use puts things in this level here, any tuples over here with the same value will end up in this level as well. Now we'll have collisions. Therefore, we'll have keys that hash to the same bucket. But that's OK. The main idea here is that at a one level going across, we know that there's nothing in these other ones that we have to examine to look for a join. We sort of put everybody in, in, this, in the same location, the same level. So now what we do is, now we do a, just a simple nested for loop over just the buckets themselves, right? We said the, the nested loop join was okay when everything fit in memory. So because these buckets will fit in memory, then we just iterate over, to, over each of them and check to see whether we have a match. Right? Yes? Is it just like reducing the range of the hash function? His question is, is, it, is this just reducing the range of the hash function? Yes. In some ways, yes. Right? Just, so like you're always going to do, like, compare the key directly when you're doing a hash. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so in the regular hash join, uh, without, without this, this step, you hash into uh, you know, a location and then if you have a lot of collisions, you're essentially going to be doing the same sequential scan, you know, whether it's a linear probing or the chain hash table. You're just doing a sequential scan to see whether you have a match. It's, so this essentially do the same thing. We're just hashing both sides. It's like a, almost like a divide and conquer kind of approach. Right? And we'll talk about parallelization later on, but you can par easily parallelize this. because You can have one thread do the join across each level. And again, the main idea is here is that at this level here, there's nothing in these other levels we'd have to care about because the hash function always put us in the right location. All right. So what's potential? One potential problem with this. So this, work, this works great. We said that now, uh, if our hash table doesn't fit in memory, we just do these buckets, potentially swap these out the disk, and then we bring in the buckets for each level one by one, and and do our for loops. What's the, well, what's the problem with this? Potentially. Exactly. What if the buckets don't fit in memory, right? So if the buckets don't fit in memory, then you have to, you have to uh, maybe split them up even more. So this is called recursive partitioning. The idea is that, again, we're just going to keep partitioning over and over again our buckets into smaller and smaller chunks 
till we can get something that'll fit in memory and then we, we can do our, our, our simple nested for loop join. So the basic idea here is that if we recognize that one of our buckets is going to overflow or get too big, then we'll apply another hash function on it that's not the same as our first hash function. And again, when I say different hash function, it's, it's you know, if we use murmur hash for the first hash function, we'll use murmur hash again for the second hash function. We're just, we're just providing it with a different salt key, right? So that it produces a di different distribution of hash, hash keys for the same values, right? So we're going to take that bucket, use another hash function, hash it all again, and then spill those out the disk. And then now when we come back and do our, our join, we just have to recognize that whether we, what level or how deep do we do our recursive partitioning to determine what hash function we should be, should be using to find the matching tuple. So going back to our example here, so again, say that we, we're building on uh, the outer table. We first do hashing. We, we hash everything, the buckets of the first hash table, and we see that this inner, inner bucket here uh, at level one, it's, it's overflowing. So we're going to go ahead and hash it again with another hash function to split it out even further. Right? And so the way to now think about in terms of levels, the, the first and the last one are still at the, the level they were assigned with when they started. But the inner one here, it's now you know, one prime, one double prime, one triple prime. Just to saying that it began at level one, but then we applied a second hash function, and now it's been split up e even further. Of course, now again, you may be thinking, oh, what happens if that if I have a second hash function where all the values here are the same and everything's going to hash to the same thing anyway? So, so can I just you know would I be stuck in an infinite loop? Again, in that case, there's nothing you can do, right? So you just have to bite you know bite the cost of just doing special scan uh, or start doing it, you know the the blockness of loop join to fetch in the pages one by one, right? Just for this this one level. I mean, data systems would recognize this, that if I'm hashing this again, everybody's the same, so I, breaking this up even further doesn't help me. All right, so now on the inner table, again, we start off with taking the first hash function, we split everything up into, uh, in, into chunks, like this, right? Again, for the outer one and the, the, the top one and the bottom one, we know that on the other side, they just got mapped to the same location with the same hash function. But if we have anything that goes to level one, then we know that we need to split this again with the second hash function and, and write it out like that. All right, so then now when we do our comparison, right, we're only comparing across uh, the same level here. All right, this is sort of like the extendable hash table or linear hash table. We kept track of what hash function we should use depending on you know, where the split pointer was or how deep the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the local depth was for a particular bucket. All right, so what is the cost of this? Well, assuming we have enough buffers, then the cost is the, essentially the three sequential scans on both tables, right? Three times n plus n, right? Because you have the partition phase, you have to read both table in, both tables in, and write them both out. So it's two, two scan, or one scan in and one write out. So it's two n plus n. Then now when you do your probing phase, Again, it's just a simple nested loop join, like well, the block nested loop join. And so it's one sequential scan on every page on the outer table and one sequential scan on the inner table. Again, the idea here is that for every single page on the inner table within a level within my buckets, I only have to go look at the pages that correspond to on the inner table at the same bucket. I don't go to the ones, the ones above me, I don't go to the ones below me. So it's just, again, two sequential scans. Sorry, just a complete sequential scan on, on both the inner and the outer. In the, in the probing phase. So let's see now this in terms of cost. So again, 3 times n plus n, so 3 times uh, 1,500 is 4,500 IOs. So we can do now scan on a fast SSD in, in 0.45 seconds, where in the sort merge join case, it was, uh, I think, 0.59 seconds. Right? So This is why, again, the, the, the hash joint is always going to be preferred. Because it's always going to be, oh, sorry, it's almost always going to be faster than the, the sort merge joint, and, and definitely almost always faster than the, the nested loop joint, unless you have an index and you're only joining a small number of things. So the, 
If the database system knows the size of the outer table, then it can use the static hash table. Right? We can just pick uh, you know, a linear probing hash table, which is really fast, and say, well, I, I know that I, I fit everything without having complete wraparound, without having, having a large number of collisions, based on what I think I'm going to actually going to need. So that's the best case scenario. And that's what data systems are going to try to do. But the issue is that, uh, as we'll see in next class, you have to estimate how many tuples you think you're going to have uh, as, as your input. And if you're just, if you're just getting the, ta the data directly from your access methods at the bottom of the tree, that may actually, it may not be hard to actually compute that. But if you're doing a join after a join after a join after a join, if you get it wrong at the bottom, then you're going to get really wrong at the top. So you may be under provisioning or uh, the size of your hash table, and you may have to do uh, you know to double the size if, if you have too many collisions. So this is you could use you know the dynamic hash tables like extendable hashing on linear hashing um, if you don't know the size. But you're going to as, as as we saw before, you're going to pay a computational overhead to maintain you know, to be able to figure out you know what buckets things should actually be in in both of those schemes. Where in the linear probing you don't have to do that. So most data systems are, are going to try to do a static hash table, but if you get it wrong, then you know, you're going to pay the penalty of doubling the size. It's really only for internal metadata you use something like extendable hashing or linear hashing, like your buffer manager that you guys have been building. Okay? So any questions about hash joins? Pretty simple to understand. Uh, the, again, and, and from our point of view, we really only care about disk IO cost. So the recursive partition approach is pretty much in the only really optimization we have available to us. We'll see the case in, um, in the advanced class when we do in-memory joins, you start to care about where the data actually is located, like, on, like what CPU socket or what level in your cache. Right? For our purposes, we don't care about this. To summarize, uh, again, the cost of all these different algorithms, again, we said that using our, our running example, in the worst case scenario, the simple nest loop join, it took 1.3 hours. We, if we do things in, in blocks, we're down to 50 seconds. You do the index nest loop join. I don't know where I got 20 seconds from. Oh, I said log in. You know, right? It's a little bit better. Uh, but then the sort merge join and the, and the hash join is, uh, is even less than that. This actually might be wrong. I don't know where I got this from. Because um, that shouldn't be log in. All right, I'll fix that later. OK. So. The main takeaway from all of this, the hash join is almost always going to be better than sorting, um, unless you know that the, the, the output needs to be sorted, or the data you're feeding into it is already sorted on, on what you want. Um, the, a good database system, we don't have time to open up Postgres, um, but a good database system can actually support all these different join algorithms and can try to figure out which one is the best for your particular workload. So Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, all the major database systems can do sort merge, nested loop join, and uh, hash joins. And then on the fly for each query, they figure out what they want to use. And then at the end of the day, it almost always comes out to be a hash join, unless you have an index already. My SQL, I don't know if it actually supports hash joins. I thought they did, and someone told me they, they didn't. We, we can check the documentation. Um, again, it might be in the, actually in version 8, but I, I don't know. So, and then SQL, like, I. Actually, I, I think SQLite might only support nested loop joins. OK, so next class, we're going to talk about, you know, I'm sort of alluding to, to this all throughout today's, to today's lecture, was next class, we'll talk about how the system's actually going to decide which algorithm it wants to use per operator. And it'll get even more complicated when we talk about joins, because it's, it's more than just saying, do I want sort merge versus hash join? It's actually making decisions about what should be the inner table versus the outer table. And how should I order my, my join operations? So if I have to, the way to think about this, I have to join table A, B, and C together. Should I join A and B first, or, or B and C first, or A later? Like all these kind of things can actually make a big difference in performance, and it actually may out overshadow the benefit you get from using sort merge versus hash join. Right? All right. So uh, no class on Wednesday. I will post the, uh, the the midterm study guide later in the week. And then uh, Project 2, Checkpoint 1 is due today. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes, it's the ST Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I could do it like a geo. 
Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dope. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cuff say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a flow to the eyes. Show. Here I come, Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watch, South Park and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the four. Six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say fruit makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>